Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Why the OWASP Top 10 Needs Identity Data Management. My name is Holly Solari. I'm with Radiant Logic, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Up first, a few housekeeping notes, and then I'll introduce today's speaker. As you watch this webinar, if you have any questions or would like a meeting, please reach out via the Contact Us button or email info at radiantlogic.com. We are standing by and ready to answer any questions in a timely manner. Let's meet our speaker. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Rusty Heaton. Rusty is a long-standing identity and access management practitioner. He has over nine years of direct experience helping clients overcome challenges with respect to getting the right user to the right resources at the right time. Rusty has played a role in developing next-generation CIAM solutions, as well as furthering crucial identity-related implementations within state and federal departments. Today, Rusty will discuss how critical getting your organization's identity data management strategy right is to preventing three of OWASP's top 10. Rusty, please take it away. Hey folks, my name is Rusty Deaton. I'm the Federal Technical Lead for Radiant Logic. Uh, I'm with you today to talk about data security. Let's get into it. So we're, we're, we're gonna be going pretty fast today, but I wanna talk with you about a few topics. First, uh, we'll get into a brief rundown of what I mean when I'm talking about security and data security. Uh, next, I'll get into OWASP and guidance they provide on security best practices. We'll talk about what, Radi what Radiant One can do to help you conform to best practices. And we'll talk about real life evidence for this. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about anything we covered today, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. To start, uh, let's talk about what security is to us. Uh, for the sake of this talk, we're talking about cybersecurity. Uh, CISA, defines it as uh, cybersecurity is the art of protecting networks, devices, and data from unauthorized access or criminal use, and the practice of ensuring confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. So I, I think that wraps up the talk. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, there's, there's a whole other rabbit hole to go down. So um, how does this apply to data and data security? So NIST has pretty similar things to say, which is to be expected, right? Data security, and indeed security in general, focuses on the CIA triad. So as a quick refresher, the CIA triad is based around confidentiality, right? Making sure that information is kept private. Integrity, making sure that information hasn't been tampered with. And availability, making sure that information can be accessed appropriately. So I, I say all of that to say this, security as we understand it, the the definitions we just went over, the CIA triad, it's its all really just risk mitigation practices. So I, I don't want to get into too much detail into the facets of risk mitigation because each of these could have their own talk and they would go for a substantial length. But ultimately, we're looking to do one of four things when we when we deal with risk, right? We, we either want to avoid risk, we want to mitigate risk, we want to transfer or accept risk. Now, in a perfect world, right, we, we would do the first three every time. But in reality, we need to understand that risk is going to be there and we just need to be prepared for the possibility. So transferring risk also has its own caveats and typically that means that the risk ceases to be managed by us directly. So let's focus on what we can manage, which would be avoidance and mitigation. So in general, um, when we avoid or mitigate risk, we're, we're looking to conform to best practices. So for instance, we might avoid information disclosure risks by using modern uh, TLS protocols, you know, uh, 1.2, 1.3, and appropriate cipher suites, which uh, depending on your industry, it could be any, any combination of them. Uh, we, we might mitigate information disclosure risks by conforming to the principle of least privilege, Right, such that if a privileged account is compromised, uh, it, it can't get to everything on the system or return all of the information that the objects it can get to has. Uh, best practices, of course, can be found in a lot of places. Industry groups will offer specific advice uh, for meeting legal requirements. Um, I'm, I'm sure that you can um, think of at least one that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, meanwhile, there are a number of organizations, institutions, and government bodies that offer best practices as well. Um, and those are typically based on evidence-driven approaches. So those are things that are based off of research papers, 
um, you know, various people have come together to, to derive these, these practices. Um, individual practitioners can contribute to these best practices as well, but we need to take care to validate these claims and evidence. Um, so let's talk more about one of those organizations now, OWASP, and, and their top 10. So the, the organization OWASP was founded back in 2001 and has been providing the OWASP top 10 since around 2003. It represents uh, a, a data-driven approach to determining the most critical threats to web application security. Uh, it is, it's updated every few years. The, the latest iteration actually came out in 2021. And of course, these rankings, because they're, they're data-driven um, and it's based on what people are seeing in the field, right? Um, they change, right? They're, they're renamed to more amply fit uh, and evolving practice. And they change based on what is seen out in the wild. So appreciably, some things may become more prevalent and less prevalent as fixes are made and the state of the art changes. So you can see some of these changes highlighted, for instance, uh, broken access control moving from, from number five to number one, right? Um, broken authentication coming down a bit and changing its name, right? Um, but we see that this is evolving and it really tries to hammer home the things we should be focusing on. So in the context of data security, right? There, there, are, there are real, there, you could say that all of the OWASP top 10 are important, but, but in the context of just data security, three of the top 10 are truly important to discuss, specifically within the context of radiant logic. So, and, and what we can offer in terms of value. So broken access control, right? Uh, identica identification and or authentication failures uh, and software and data integrity failures. So let's, let's dive in to uh, those selected vulnerabilities for uh, each of those items. So in general, broken access controls vulnerabilities revolve around people being able to create, read, update, or delete things they should not be able to, whether that be through getting admin privileges when they shouldn't, or just having those capabilities without working for them. It's a series of issues that needs to be considered and addressed. Failure to do this will directly impact the confidentiality, integrity of a system confidentiality in that if all data is allowed to be read by anyone, we lose confidentiality and integrity in that we stop knowing the validity of a given set of information if permitted rights are suddenly permitted. Identification and authentication failures themes include concerns around identity and authentication, predictably. Uh, a user identity is commonly defined as a, a set of attributes representing a non-machine user. For instance, first name, last name, email, login name, and so on. Authentication is commonly defined as a given user proving who they say they are. This is typically done with one or more factors of authentication. Uh, issues that might arise here have to do with an attacker being able to get into identities they don't have a claim to, uh, whether that be through authenticating as them or stealing that session, um, of an authenticated user. This goes back directly to confidentiality and integrity, right? If, if someone is able to get into an account that isn't theirs, we lose confidentiality. If someone can perform unwarranted actions on our behalf, we lose integrity. So you're, you're kind of seeing a pattern here. There's, there's a lot of CIA action. So our, our final item, right, is around software and data integrity failures. And those themes relate to allowing an attacker to undermine security by winning the fight before it even starts. And, and what I mean by that is um, by modifying programs before they're installed, um, such as modifying the source code of an application uh, before it gets um, deployed or modifying configurations that are to be applied to systems um, that will then be used for feature compromise. Um, this could also mean hijacking the mechanisms by which an application updates. And it, it could mean putting malicious code itself into the update package. Um, this affects all aspects of the CIA triad, right? Uh, an attacker who can modify a system um, can erode confidentiality, integrity, and availability as they, as they wish. So let's talk about fixing these issues, right? So 
OWASP points on broken access controls predictably are to use good access management hygiene. Now, what Radiant One can help do here is foster appropriate data security by offering robust security policies out of the gate, right? We, we deny by default. Uh, you can set up access, access controls to conform to industry best practices. Um, and we do so in a variety of ways, right? You could use role-based access controls. You could use attribute-based access controls. Um, we can get incredibly granular on how someone accesses the system. Um, we also offer robust lifecycle um, intelligence with our logging setup so that that can be consumed by a SIM, for instance, and determine when a user logs in, what they're doing, and those sort of aspects. So you can learn off that. Um, finally, every node in a cluster shares configuration so that access reuse or access control reuse rather is easy, um, which, which saves a lot of time and prevents errors and omissions from occurring, which is commonly an issue in larger scale systems. So with respect to fixing identification and act, uh, authentication failures, uh, OWASP's guidance on this is to generally be thoughtful about when, where, and how authentication is done. Um, this, this isn't on the slide, but OWASP also recommends monitoring logs to determine when an attack is occurring around brute force attacks or credential stuffing attempts. Um, just as a quick aside, brute forcing would be an attacker, for instance, entering A for a password, then AA for a password, and so on and so forth, where credential stuffing might be where a user um, has been previously compromised with password. Uh, for instance, uh, they may use the password hunter1 at a, at a website, and the attacker may elect to use that same password and login at your site to try and get in, right? That's that's credential stuffing. So Radiant can help solve these challenges, right, with, with robust password policy tools that are IETF driven and extensible so that if, if Radiant isn't doing what you want out of the box, you can change it, which is great. Um, Radiant is also configured to install, or add install rather, to have cluster specific credentials. Um, and those credentials can be changed through relatively simple operational processes. So we aren't sticking you with default passwords that, that suddenly can't be changed um, because you set it at the beginning of time and, and now you're stuck with a six character password, which, which is great in this, this threat environment, right? Um, so on next to fixing software and data integrity failures. Um, OWASP's guidance ties back a bit into what we first talked about, right? Which was fixing broken access controls. Um, we should be confirming, right, what we downloaded um, and, and confirming that it's what we expected. Typically, we do this through checksums, um, which is, in a way, um, a crude form of authentication. And in fact, um, checksums are used for machine authentication codes. We won't get into it here, but it's a, it's a great point to think about. Um, we should also be ensuring our configurations are valid and reviewable, and we should be instituting access controls to ensure that attackers simply can't make changes to those, those configurations uh, as they may be in GitHub or what have you, as they see fit, right? Um, Radiant helps conform to this by, by offering thoughtfully integrated containers on both Docker Hub as well as DoD's Iron Bank. And we allow for configuration processes to be automated um, and those configurations to be auditable within a CI CD infrastructure. So for instance, um, our configurations can be stored in GitHub, right? And then if any configuration drift is detected, right? You could redo those containers using the fresh and stored configuration mechanisms. Uh, as a final note, right? When, when using Radiant One in a containerized manner, um, we also make it fairly easy to plug into a CI CD pipeline um, that use tools such as Trivi or Gripe to develop SBOMs, right? Uh, we won't get into that here, but that's another fun thing. Um, perform security uh, vulnerability assessments, um, for instance, to see what, what libraries are vulnerable in a given container uh, and remediate known issues programmatically. That way, right, we're saving time, we're reducing the possibility of errors and omissions, which is ultimately win-win. You may be thinking, this is great, but how does Radiant's claims tie into the real world? How, how has this been proven, right? So um, a, a total economic impact or TEI study has been done by Forrester and offers some solid insight into the general benefits of Radiant Logic. At, at a super high level, right? Um, the, the TEI found that, that Radiant increased operational agility. That means to say 
that it, it let people solve problems better and faster, right? It accelerated digital transformation efforts. That means to say that it let people get away from old and inefficient solutions. Uh, it enhanced security. It did what we, we just talked about mere moments ago. And um, it enabled strategic initiative innovation, which is to say that it gave people latitude to make better decisions for their organizations. Uh, here you'll find two big points, and I, I don't want to read from the slides um, directly. So I'll offer a few points that customers gave around our product that you can find in the TEI. So the first one is that um, <clears throat> we had Active Directory within our environment, but needed a solution that would provide more flexibility and deliver greater efficiency and data security. So as a security practitioner, um, and I'm sure those of you watching uh, all understand Active Directory is, is not the greatest when it comes to security. There's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of caveats. It's not certainly something that you'd wanna just put open on the internet and let people have fun reaching out to. Um, you almost wanna treat that like a Fort Knox, right? Um, and even then, right, the, the password hashing mechanisms that they use um, are antiquated at best, MD4. So when someone actually compromises the system, the time to crack on those passwords, should it get compromised, is incredibly low. We're talking in the space of hours. Um, so it becomes uh, critical to at, at least protect that infrastructure. And, and Radiant can offer a path to acting effectively as a firewall around that, which is great. Um, the, the second point that I want to offer um, from the TEI is before Radiant Logic, we were leveraging another product for directory services, but over time that product became highly insecure and did not keep up with regulatory requirements. Since we transitioned into Radiant Logic, our data is much more secure. Through its integrated and advanced connection methodology, Radiant Logic has enhanced our data security. Um, the, the one great thing about Radiant Logic um, from working with it for so long is that um, we allow a wide range of items to connect to us securely. So if someone wants to come in over REST or SKIM, uh, we allow that in a, in a fairly graceful manner. If someone wants to come in over LDAP-S, we allow that as well. Um, and we can integrate with all sorts of backends as well to, to truly allow for a secure place for data to be consumed and provided. Um, it, it's, it's quite nice. So, um, Ultimately, what can we take away from the top 10 and uh, everything we just talked about, right? So security is hard, right? There, there, there's no two ways about it. Uh, the, the guidance from OWASP helps us mitigate and avoid risk by offering best practices. And of course, these best practices seldom make things simpler. Organizations may be tempted to simply roll their own security solutions. And I'm sure there's a joke in here somewhere about rolling your own cryptography. But in reality, doing so is extremely hard. And if, if built entirely in-house could lead to undiscovered risk down the line, if, if not handled appropriately. Uh, Radiant Logic helps solve this by conforming to best practices easier. Um, it helps reduce complexities associated with creating your own solutions um, relevant to identity and access management. Um, and it helps keep your data model sane by enforcing uh, conformity to um, predefined schemas, which helps in the long run. Um, so if you've made it this far with me, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. You can get the TEI study as well as calculate potential savings based on the model laid out in the TEI by scanning the relevant QR codes. Uh, I look forward to our next talk. Back to Holly. Thank you, Rusty, both for your time and insights on today's webinar and to our audience for listening in as well. As a reminder to our listeners, if you have any unanswered questions, please use our contact us button to ask or reach out via info at radiantlogic.com. And we will follow up with a detailed answer as soon as possible. Thank you all and have a great day.